Testimony Treasures, Volume 1, Chapter 8, Be Zealous and Repent Dear Brethren and Sisters, The Lord has shown me in vision some things concerning the Church and its present lukewarm state, which I will relate to you. The Church was presented before me in vision. Said the angel to the Church, Jesus speaks to thee, Be zealous and repent. This work, I saw, should be taken hold of in earnest. There is something to repent of. Worldly-mindedness, selfishness, and covetousness have been eating out the spirituality and life of God's people. The danger of God's people for a few years past has been the love of the world. Out of this have sprung the sins of selfishness and covetousness. The more they get of this world, the more they set their affections on it, and still they reach out for more. Said the angel, It is easier for a camel to go through a needle's eye than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. Yet many who profess to believe that we are having the last note of warning to the world are striving with all their energies to place themselves in a position where it is easier for a camel to go through a needle's eye than for them to enter the kingdom. These earthly treasures are blessings when rightly used. Those who have them should realize that they are lent them of God and should cheerfully spend their means to advance His cause. They will not lose their reward here. They will be kindly regarded by the angels of God and will also lay up a treasure in heaven. I saw that Satan watches the peculiar, selfish, covetous temperament of some who profess the truth, and he will tempt them by throwing prosperity in their path, offering them the riches of earth. He knows that if they do not overcome their natural temperament, they will stumble and fall by loving mammon, worshipping their idol. Satan's object is often accomplished. The strong love of the world overcomes or swallows up the love of the truth. The kingdoms of the world are offered them, and they eagerly grasp their treasure and think they are wonderfully prospered. Satan triumphs because his plan has succeeded. They have given up the love of God for the love of the world. The Love of the World I saw that those who are thus prospered can thwart the design of Satan if they will overcome their selfish covetousness by laying all their possessions upon the altar of God. And when they see where means are needed to advance the cause of truth and to help the widow, the fatherless, and afflicted, they should give cheerfully and thus lay up treasure in heaven." Heed the counsel of the true witness. Buy gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich, white raiment that thou mayest be clothed, and eye salve that thou mayest see. Make some effort. These precious treasures will not drop upon us without some exertion on our part. We must buy, be zealous, and repent of our lukewarm state. We must be awake to see our wrongs, to search for our sins, and to zealously repent of them. I saw that the brethren who have possessions have a work to do to tear away from these earthly treasures and to overcome their love of the world. Many of them love this world, love their treasure, but are not willing to see it. They must be zealous and repent of their selfish covetousness that the love of the truth may swallow up everything else. I saw that many of those who have riches will fail to buy the gold, white raiment, and eye salve. Their zeal does not possess intensity and earnestness proportionate to the value of the object of which they are in pursuit. I saw these men while striving for the possessions of earth. What zeal they manifested, what earnestness, what energy to obtain an earthly treasure that must soon pass away. What cool calculations they made. They plan and toil early and late, and sacrifice their ease and comfort for earthly treasure. A corresponding zeal on their part to obtain the gold, white raiment, and eye salve will bring them in possession of these desirable treasures and life, everlasting life, in the kingdom of God. I saw that if any need eye salve, it is those who have earthly possessions. Many of them are blind to their own state blind to their firm grasp upon this world, 
oh, that they may see. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. I saw that many have so much rubbish piled up at the door of their heart that they cannot get the door open. Some have difficulties between themselves and their brethren to remove. Others have evil tempers, selfish covetousness to remove before they can open the door. Others have rolled the world before the door of their heart, which bars the door. All this rubbish must be taken away, and then they can open the door and welcome the Savior in. Oh, how precious was this promise as it was shown to me in vision! I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. Oh, the love, the wondrous love of God! After all our lukewarmness and sins, he says, Return unto me, and I will return unto thee, and will heal all thy backslidings. This was repeated by the angel a number of times. Return unto me, and I will return unto thee, and will heal all thy backslidings. Some, I saw, would gladly return. Others will not let this message to the Laodicean church have its weight upon them. They will glide along much after the same manner as before, and will be spewed out of the mouth of the Lord. Those only who zealously repent will have favor with God. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame, and am set down with my Father in his throne. We can overcome, yes, fully, entirely. Jesus died to make a way of escape for us, that we might overcome every evil temper, every sin, every temptation, and sit down at last with him. It is our privilege to have faith and salvation. The power of God has not decreased. His power, I saw, would be just as freely bestowed now as formerly. It is the church of God that have lost their faith to claim, their energy to wrestle, as did Jacob, crying, I will not let thee go, except thou bless me. Enduring faith has been dying away. It must be revived in the hearts of God's people. There must be a claiming of the blessing of God. Faith, living faith, always bears upward to God and glory. Unbelief, downward to darkness and death. Manufacturing Trials I saw that the minds of some of the church have not run in the right channel. There have been some peculiar temperaments that have had their notions by which to measure their brethren, and if any did not exactly agree with them, there was trouble in the camp at once. Some have strained at a gnat and swallowed a camel. These set notions have been humored and indulged altogether too long. There has been a picking at straws, and when there were no real difficulties in the church, Trials have been manufactured. The minds of the church and the servants of the Lord are called from God, truth, and heaven to dwell upon darkness. Satan delights to have such things go on. It feasts him, but these are none of the trials which are to purify the church, and that will in the end increase the strength of God's people. I saw that some are withering spiritually. They have lived some time watching to keep their brethren straight, watching for every fault to make trouble with them. And, while doing this, their minds are not on God, nor on heaven, nor on the truth, but just where Satan wants them, on someone else. Their souls are neglected. They seldom see or feel their own faults, for they have had enough to do to watch the faults of others without so much as looking to their own souls or searching their own hearts. A person's dress, bonnet, or apron takes their attention. They must talk to this one or that one, and it is sufficient to dwell upon for weeks. I saw that all the religion a few poor souls have consists in watching the garments and acts of others and finding fault with them. Unless they reform, there will be no place in heaven for them, for they would find fault with the Lord himself. Said the angel, it is an individual work to be right with God. The work is between God and our own souls. But when persons have so much care of others' faults, 
they take no care of themselves. These notional fault-finding ones would often cure themselves of the habit if they would go directly to the individual they think is wrong. It would be so crossing that they would give up their notions rather than go. But it is easy to let the tongue run freely about this one or that one when the accused is not present. Order in Worship Some think it is wrong to try to observe order in the worship of God. But I have seen that it is not dangerous to observe order in the church of God. I have seen that confusion is displeasing to the Lord, and that there should be order in praying and also in singing. We should not come to the house of God to pray for our families unless deep feeling shall lead us while the Spirit of God is convicting them. Generally, the proper place to pray for our families is at the family altar. When the subjects of our prayers are at a distance, the closet is the proper place to plead with God for them. When in the house of God, we should pray for a present blessing and should expect God to hear and answer our prayers. Such meetings will be lively and interesting. I saw that all should sing with the Spirit and with the understanding also. God is not pleased with jargon and discord. Right is always more pleasing to Him than wrong. And the nearer the people of God can approach to correct, harmonious singing, the more He is glorified, the church benefited, and unbelievers favorably affected. I have been shown the order, the perfect order of heaven, and have been enraptured as I listened to the perfect music there. After coming out of vision, the singing here has sounded very harsh and discordant. I have seen companies of angels who stood in a hollow square, everyone having a harp of gold. At the end of the harp was an instrument, the turn, to set the harp or change the tunes. Their fingers did not sweep over the strings carelessly, but they touched different strings to produce different sounds. There is one angel who always leads, who first touches the harp and strikes the note. Then all join in the rich, perfect music of heaven. It cannot be described. It is melody, heavenly, divine, while from every countenance beams the image of Jesus, shining with glory unspeakable. God's people are not to be in confusion, lacking order and harmony, consistency and beauty. The Lord is greatly dishonored when disunion exists among His people. Truth is a unit. The unity that God requires must be cultivated day by day if we would answer the prayer of Christ. The disunion that is striving for existence among those who profess to believe the last message of mercy to be given to the world must find no place, for it would be a fearful hindrance to the advancement of God's work. His servants are to be one, as Christ is one with the Father. Their powers, illuminated, inspired, and sanctified, must be united to make a complete whole. Those who love God and keep His commandments are not to draw apart. They are to press together.